This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of Brain Chips. This is our mission podcast. This is Nandan Nampali, Chief Marketing Officer of Brainship. And this is a special episode as it deals with a really hot topic, space technology. Most of you might be aware that on March 4th last week, Brainship's Akita technology was launched into space aboard the Transporter 10 spacecraft through our partners, ANT61 and the Space Machines Company. The AK-1000 chip will be the brain of ANT61's brain computer, which is designed to support intelligent robotic services for maintenance of space infrastructure. As you can tell, space technology is a fast-growing field, and BrainChip is excited to be an integral part of it. So today's podcast is designed as a panel discussion, and I will not be the host, but an ardent listener. Today's host is BrainChip's very own CTO, Dr. Tony Lewis, who joined us in November. Tony has had a storied career in AI and in neuromorphic compute in particular, with important stints in HP Labs and Qualcomm R&D. So today's guests then are from the European Space Agency, Laurent Healy and Luis Mancia. Laurent Healy holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from the Institut National Polytechnique, Toulouse, Laurent started his career in 1995 as a DSP and ASIC engineer at Thales Alenia Space and as an SOC designer thereafter with Motorola. From 2002, Laurent joined the European Space Agency with the European Space Research and Technology Center, or ESTEC, as a microelectronics expert and has supervised the development of rad hard ASIC technologies. Currently, Laurent oversees the onboarding of process technologies, and IP, more specifically, AI hardware accelerators for space applications. Laurent is currently leading several research activities in the field of AI and neuromorphic and made first contact with BrainChip nearly four years ago and has been engaged with us ever since. The other guest is Luis Mancia, who is a software engineer and an AI expert. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the Carlos III University of Madrid and a master of science in soft computing and intelligence systems from the University of Granada. With over 15 years as a software engineer and an AI engineer with expertise in the fields of computer vision and natural language processing, for the past five years, he has been working as the AI expert in the software technology section at ESTEC where he's exploring the use of AI for space applications. With that, let me hand over to Tony. Spaceflight began about 70 years ago, and there was tremendous interest by the public. And people felt that the space race was very important to them. But then over 30 years or so, interest tapered off. Laurent, Luis, do you see an, an increased interest in space mm-hmm right now and um and is it important to the average person so yes i mean uh, indeed i mean the the race as you mentioned uh, tony i mean started 70 years ago and at the time as you know very well there was uh, this uh, geopolitic uh, race uh, between the west side and east side and uh, that was a motivation mainly and um and um indeed i mean the, during uh, let's say yeah, the 60s 70s uh, 80s, I mean, uh, yeah, indeed, some motivation, but the main uh, stakeholder were the government's agencies, mainly. And um, what we see the past uh, decade is uh, uh, easier, I mean, uh, private investor now and company, what we call the new space, of course, one uh, one very, I mean, uh, exemplif- exemplified by um, a company like SpaceX. And uh, as we all witnessed, I mean, the quite uh, impressive achievement with a reusable launcher, making access to space uh, easier, cheaper, faster. 
and uh, giving also opportunities to new companies and uh, smaller companies, not only limited to the agencies, uh, to uh, yeah, to to develop their own solutions and fly, fly them at a lower cost. So yes, there is a, a regain of interest. I would say the last uh, last ten years, and uh, and and I, I think it's good also for the agencies like uh, NASA, like uh, like uh, ESA. Uh, it gives also a um, stimulation to um, maybe, um, yeah, take a bit of inspiration from the new space as well. So, yeah, Luis, maybe you want to. Yeah, absolutely. I think I completely agree with that. I think we are witnessing a new, new space era. Uh, I think uh, one of the main factors as well is because we are now capable of, of at least trying to, to achieve a uh, uh, new, new, amazing uh, missions. So we are talking now about, for example, again going back to Moon, uh, about having a uh, humankind orbiting uh, on the Moon or pers or a permanent presence of on the surface. Uh, discussions on reaching Mars. So I think that's also helping a lot to to make it space uh, uh, sexy again. I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, do you see for the average person, um, you know, the average person probably isn't going to go to Mars or anything like that. Um, like in their in their daily life, do you think uh, space is becoming more important? Um, you know, I you know, like Elon Musk has put up a, a system for communication all around the, the globe, for instance. Um, there's more environmental monitoring. Are, are these things, um, you know, of importance uh, to the ESA? Yeah. I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think a lot of citizens do not realize that uh, space is okay. We, we focus on the SpaceX and the visible part of the iceberg, let's say, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a lot of things, a lot of infrastructure today, uh, ground, ground infrastructure rely on uh, space infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, to, um, uh, to give some example, of course, you mentioned telecommunication, of course, is one, one aspect. And uh, other aspect is uh, global uh, Earth, um, yeah, uh, Earth observation and uh, monitoring of the resource and uh, and climate, which is very important. Uh, and um, and of course, global navigation satellite system GNSS, mm -hmm. GPO, GPS, and uh, and uh, okay, maybe in the daily life of the citizen, for sure, maybe science and exploration, but uh, yeah, uh, is, is maybe less uh, less impacting, but. Uh, uh, it's important as well to contribute to uh, increase the knowledge, uh, science knowledge. I mean, so so yeah, uh, space is there, and and I think the contribution of space in uh, in our uh, life in the future will become more and more, and we see it uh, every day, uh, more and more um, uh, important. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it almost seems that as though a lot of the benefits that we get from uh, space. Are invisible to us like uh you yeah, mentioned uh, you know navigation systems telecommunication yeah. systems we don't even know know that uh, space is involved um Luis, is there anything you'd like to add uh, to that no uh, yeah uh, exactly so for example you mentioned before uh earth observation and also was mentioned by Laura. and i think uh, in that regard for for instance europe is is leading in this case for example the the earth observation uh, area we are generating a, a huge quantities of data that are helping us to to address uh, mm. critical challenges such as uh, global warming and that for sure is impacting uh, the, the the life of uh, everyone so but as you say sometimes it's, it's not uh, noticeable but that is very uh, very important and then there are a uh, myriad of uh, scientific, scientific research that are done that are then transferred to mm. to to the to use on, on earth so mm -hmm. there are many, many, many applications. So new biomaterials, uh, I know, uh, uh, experiments in microgravity that then can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of things that are transferred. If we go a little bit more, let's say, for example, to the domain uh, where Lohan and myself are looking, if you look, at, if you look for example, at, at um, uh, embedded, for example, embedded uh, designs that uh, we need to 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 be able to to decide for, for meeting the very strict requirement in, in terms of power, for example, on or on the space that can easily be transferred to application on Earth, automotive mm -hmm. application, IoT application. So there are plenty of 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 of, of uh, transfer technology between space and Earth, for example, that impact the the average person. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And yeah, even so on Earth over the last 10 years, there's been uh, an incredible explosion of, of technology. You know, you know everything from um, back in the 2000s when you had the invention of uh uh, you know, the smartphone. But then after that, we had the rise of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the rise of much faster computing. Um, so I imagine this is uh, this these technological advances have had uh, some impact on space as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, and um, I, I mean, the, the progress we've done in uh, in terms of uh, miniaturization, for instance, I mean, and uh, talking about a mo mobile phone, I mean, uh, so those technologies uh, yes, I've, I've, I've enabled uh, yeah, the mobile phone, the smartphone, as we know today. And, and of course, so, some of those technologies have been spinning as well in, um, in space, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so we see that uh, probably in the future, there will be more and more infrastructure moving to space, including uh, cl cloud, cloud services. I mean, so it's maybe um, yeah, a longer term perspective, but uh, we can expect in the five, 10 years to see some uh, processing node server in space as well. I mean, wow. So, wow. yeah. So yeah. surfers in space, uh, yes. that, that, yeah. that's quite, that's quite a concept. And, and what we see as well is a um, system of system. Of course, uh, the, the, the master system is a GPS, uh, GNSS, mm -hmm. because everything rely on, on that service. So, but uh, we see that uh, interconnection of uh, telecommunication with navigation, mm -hmm. with observation, maybe in the future with even in, in orbit uh, processing node uh, server, basically. So that's that's something, uh, some um, uh, reflection analysis we do have um, at the agency, even if for the time being, it's still, uh, let's say, adv advanced concept, but we, and I'm sure the, on the on the U.S. side, I mean, uh, same uh, same uh, same uh, analysis and uh, some, uh, yeah reflection. Yes, yeah. Mm. So, um, if you put a server in space, mm -hmm. um, can you give me some examples of how you would make use of that? Like, what would it be good for? Or just you know, in general, putting a lot of processing um, you know, into space technology like what would we do with it that we can't do today well maybe Go with it. yes uh, also answering a bit uh, the the topic that you introduced before about artificial intelligence on earth how that can be used in space i mm -hmm. mean one one key area where we are looking at is to increase autonomy um, mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. and that can be applied uh, in different situations uh, can be applied for improving the safety of the mission or to 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 to, to get a better um, um, a return of of investment on the mission. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you can definitely think on on how to apply AI on these kind of situations, and you can definitely think uh, definitely think on that that we will require more 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 capabilities, uh, computational mm -hmm. capabilities uh, on board as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, I think uh, yeah. I, I mean, it just seems that this is a seismic shift in, in the, um, you know, for governmental agencies to now begin to trust AI systems, autonomous systems, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, for critical functions, you know, at the beginning of the space age, uh, science fiction writers and movie makers uh, toyed with the idea of having artificial intelligence on board a uh, very sophisticated spacecraft and and you know that didn't uh, those stories usually didn't end well but now we seem to have a need or uh, an increasing trust in in the ability of ai to um, allow us to achieve autonomy um, what, what do you think changed is it just the, our perceptions about ai or is it maybe driven by the absolute need that we have to have autonomy in space, and this is the way to achieve it. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, and uh, we, I mean, uh, not only space, but uh, various sectors like automotive, um, uh, aviation are wondering how we may uh, certify, qualify AI for uh, safety critical uh, application. It's still um, a complex subject. It's still an open uh, subject. 
uh, we and uh, we are working at the agency and we have working group uh, looking at um, how we may indeed uh, start let's say qualify so we have some handbook uh, under drafting at the moment mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, i would say we we will deploy ai in a staggered uh, way i mean so mm -hmm. we will not uh, we will not deploy ai uh, immediately for uh, safety critical application there mm -hmm. are plenty of um, i mean several cases and i can give you one concrete example uh, for instance uh, today the satellite are generating a, a huge amount of data you know uh, and earth observation for instance everything becomes uh, high, high resolution so moving um, sensor 1k 2k 4k even more and uh, and as you can imagine those satellites they, they they have to store the the data on board so we have what we call um, in the past was a kind of tech recorder <laughs> Now it's called the solid state uh, mass memory, mm -hmm. and uh, we use uh, flash uh, technology. Okay, pass through the details, but uh, but yeah. The so the cost of storing the data on board uh, is uh, is huge. I mean, because uh, yeah, the, the size of the mass memory increase, the cost of um, having a, a, te a broadband telemetry to downstream the data the, the data to the ground station. You know when you fly. In the low Earth orbit, you have a time window. This time window can be yeah, 20 minutes or something like that. And then you have to, to, to downstream your data on the, to the ground station. So you have a very limited time, a huge amount of data. So today, just to give you a concrete example uh, for AI, is to remove useless data. Typically, you have an Earth observation satellite. You have cloud. Why would you store when you want to monitor the, the ground, you want to monitor the sea, but if you have uh, between your spacecraft and the ground, you have clouds mm -hmm. observing the, 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 the surface of Earth, be the surface ground, be the surface of the sea, then you understand that you are storing on board useless, uh, useless data, you know, and it has a cost, of course. And, um, and that, so the AI, yes, one of the very first use cases uh we we've been looking at looking at at the agency was what we call that data on board data reduction you know so okay. of course if you make a mistake if you make a mistake if instead of classifying the cloud uh, you yeah you 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 make a, it has no real um, let's say um, safety critical impact on on the mission okay you misinterpret some data bon, okay uh, it's not uh, it's not, uh, it's not going to jeopardize your mission, you know. So we are looking at those use cases, what we call non-critical application. So that will be the, the, the probably the, the first use case for, for AI in space indeed. And then, mm -hmm. then slowly we will look at, uh, yeah, autonomous system, uh, safety critical system, but we still have to make progress uh, indeed on the, on the way we may uh, we may qualify certify those uh, AI indeed how, how can we end over uh, to to AI yes yeah yeah uh, Luis yeah exactly so I, I just wanted also to, to, to stress what uh, what Laurent said uh, and answering a bit what you mentioned at the beginning I think we are still not looking at using AI for for safety critical applications because there's mm -hmm. still a lot of uh, 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 questions to be answered. So Loan already pointed point out, and we are looking at, for example, which is the hardware and the software that we will require to execute mm -hmm. the AI. But we now we are talking about for on board, let's say, in the, in the flag segment, um, and what needs to be uh, done to qualify that. And that that is is kind of um exercise done before understanding new new the new new capabilities that we will require for this type of system that might be higher mm -hmm. than before, but. It, Okay, it's something that we we have some experience, and then there are there 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 are also some 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 uh, aspects that are specific of artificial intelligence, and now are not specific all of for only for space. Are specific of the use of artificial intelligence. So, for example, how to be how to deal with uh, the uncertainty associated with these type of systems is something mm -hmm. that uh, we also need to understand how to properly uh, manage that situation, and. So that's why also we cannot jump deal into the safety critical applications. We still mm -hmm. need to see how how to how to deal with this. But mm -hmm. as Logan said, even before that, there are plenty of opportunities to mm -hmm. apply that. So he already mentioned uh, like um, uh, the use of on board for for uh, reducing the the size of data. I mean, one can think on uh, future uh, robotic uh, missions. For example, you can have uh, an 
computer vision on board for for classification or object localization or segmentation, whatever the for many different applications. And then you can you can use the information from that uh, already specific AI module to have also some uh, onboard decision making, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that can also be I'm saying Robert, but you can think on the same situation for for satellites as well mm -hmm. uh, to be able to process images or to be able to process, uh, for example, for for health monitoring. This is an area we are looking a lot. Uh, we mm -hmm. are processing a, a telemetry and more, mm -hmm. uh, and that that also helps to reduce the cost of operation. For example, so there mm -hmm. are plenty of opportunities as well yeah, correct, that correct. are not related to safety critical to apply that. Yeah, yeah, Laurent. Yeah, correct. Uh, I mean, Luis, just to complement on what you said, I mean, uh, reduce the cost of operation. Uh, it's a good, uh, good example. I mean, um, uh, we we see a big trend uh, those past years uh, with uh, constellation. Okay, we are not uh, yet in Europe in, into uh, mega constellation. Okay, one way by Airbus, and uh, but uh, we we have to reduce the cost, and the cost means that we have to do more onboard processing. So onboard is not necessarily uh, AI, yeah, huh? but it could be AI, but. Uh, mm -hmm. And and uh, but uh, we have to to uh, yeah the satellite will have to to gain more more autonomy with respect to the ground segment and the the uh, ground control, and um, that's why uh, we we've been leading the past uh, years uh, some study. One of the very first study indeed was to look at uh, uh, as Luis, Luis mentioned the uh, Earth monitoring satellite Earth monitoring, so uh, detecting the for instance micro vibration you know. Uh, temperature increase, uh, current uh, current power increase on the on the equipment, and 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 even before uh, you you exceed the threshold, then you are you can monitor the the slow variation, the the trend, you know, and uh, and raise a flag even before the error uh, materializes, you know. So mm -hmm. so um, so we are not we do not plan to replace the traditional what we we call it in our uh, uh, let's say language uh, fault detection, identification, and recovery. And recovery. Uh, we do not uh, aim to replace the traditional um, FDAR, but uh, we 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 will uh, complement using uh, machine learning because with machine learning we have access on board to data which are not necessarily downstream to the ground control. Yes. Could, could we just, um, um, before we go on, um, just drill down a little bit um, mm -hmm. into why we need to do processing on board. Cool. So, um, you know, uh, the average listener might be thinking, well, you know, I have uh, I have very good connectivity to, um, to the cloud. I do a lot of my processing in the cloud. Um, these uh, these orbiting vehicles, you know, they, they aren't, uh, you know, hundreds of light years away. You know, why can't we just do all our processing uh, uh, using terrestrial uh, computation and, and using some sort of communication link? You know, why isn't that uh, a good solution to this, uh, this problem of processing data? Uh, mm, mm, not sure if I understood the, the, the okay. currently the question, but maybe just to, to clarify something, what, in these this kind of examples that we are giving, we are talking about the processing the data that is generated within the mission. So we are not talking of uh, offloading a specific processing capabilities from from Earth into a space uh, mm -hmm. asset. So that that's 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 another interesting use case. Let's say I think Laura mentioned that at the beginning, where <clears throat> maybe we we want to to start having more like a cloud computing space computing, offloading some of these uh, processing mm -hmm. capabilities. But uh, for for the for when we are talking also uh, about uh, when we are talking now in the different scenarios we mentioned before about processing data, we are talking specifically about that data generated within that specific mission. Okay. Well, well, I mean, you know, if you could talk, you know, so you're trying to do everything locally, trying to do your computation locally. I, I guess that that's what I'm taking away from this. But uh, what drives the need for that local computation? Uh, yeah. Is it latency? Is it the cost of, of communication? Yeah, Laurent. Yeah, um, it's a good point. I mean, uh, wh why? Why? Okay, I have to admit, until um, the last decade, and I've been two decades in the agency, and I can tell you when I joined the agency, I mean, sometimes was a bit, um, 
uh, disappointing in terms of onboard processing, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, because um, the main concept was to, um, to uh, you have sensor, the sensor can be a radar, can be a camera, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the idea was to store the what we call the raw data in the, mm -hmm. in the mass memory. And mm -hmm. to and but at that time the, the again the resolution was lower, and uh, so there was no let's say bandwidth limitation with a mm, downstream uh, mm -hmm. link, you know, and um, and then then uh, slowly we realize okay it's not uh, the situation is not anymore sustainable. So uh, but when you talk to scientists they they, they prefer to have the uh, un raw data and uh, mm -hmm. to. Um, no, no, no filtering, no modification for, for yeah. And um, so the, the idea was to, okay, yeah, we need to do some onboard processing uh, to reduce the, the amount of data we don't stream to ground, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, now to why AI? Um, so AI, as I gave you before the example of the cloud, okay, it's just an example. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we also need AI because of um, yeah latency typically, and uh, you uh, you want to you you have um, an autonomous lander for instance, but you know you have a communication latency for instance Mars 20, 20 minutes you know, and uh, you 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 don't have the choice you have to hand over uh, the to to your onboard computer to the software to mm -hmm. potentially AI to detect. Uh, Autonomously obstacles uh, like crater, like uh, rocks, like uh, slope, you know. So, so yes, uh, some case, some use cases like uh, uh, lander, rover, drone, docking, uh, debris removal. Um, yeah, space situation awareness. We we will have to end over to uh, autonomous system, mm -hmm. and those autonomous system. Most likely, we'll we'll have to rely on on image processing, mm -hmm. real time image processing, uh, and therefore, okay, we can use some maybe for the simplest simplest use case, we can use traditional uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. but most likely we'll have to use yes con convolutional network, and uh, we are object detection, <clears throat> object classification. Uh, optical flow, you know, this type of things. So yes, I mean, probably we'll need, uh, we'll need uh, the, the support of AI, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, Luis. No. Luis. Yes, exactly. So I think it's going back a bit to what we mentioned before about autonomy. And so there are a lot of situations where we will require more autonomy. Uh, and the it is fantastic that now there are two we are we are living this new space era, and at the same time we are living a new this new AI revolution, mm -hmm. because the combination of both is what is is gonna be, I think, in my opinion, make will make possible in the coming years, a great uh, different breakthroughs on different areas. Mm -hmm. uh, because now we are because of that because of this combination, we 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 are looking at. At uh, challenges that before were not possible, we didn't think were, were possible in terms, for example, of increasing of autonomy. And mm -hmm. not only about computer vision, I mean, uh, okay, uh, we can also talk even about uh, large language models, how that can also help mm -hmm. to support astronauts in, a, as, as we mentioned before, in the in orbiting the moon or when they are going to be in the, in the, in the, uh, moon operations or in mm -hmm. Mars, as, mm -hmm. as, as Logan mentioned, depending on the on the uh, position of the Earth of, of yeah. on, on Mars, you might be between five and twenty or thirty minutes of delay. So, mm -hmm. so it, 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 I think we are just lucky that these two things are happening at the same time. Yeah. And then, but, yeah. But but also, I just you know, um, you know, I have some experience in AI, and I know that it usually takes a lot of processing power. You know, and when you start running, uh, you know, a regular GPU in a room, it'll heat up the room. It's it it it's, it, it just uses so much energy, and and there's no place to plug things in. You can't plug your satellite in. You can't plug your your lunar rover in uh, to a look, to an outlet. You can't use fans to cool it. How do you how do you deal with all those problems in in space uh, or all? Um, I think you pinpoint the 
the, the problem here, indeed, because a uh, lot of efforts, and I remember we started the discussion, you, you talk about the mobile phone, indeed, and uh, uh, the miniaturization, and it's quite amazing the computational power you, you have nowadays in a, in, a, in a phone, and this uh, revolution, the miniaturization also led later to the development of the, the GPUs, as we see today, uh, driven mm -hmm. by, by the gaming. And then, then, then we saw that uh, the GPU, some people had the br bright idea to use a GPU for other purposes, like, like uh, Bitcoin mining, but mm -hmm. also, <laughs> but also uh, to use a GPU, you know, for uh, uh, massive parallel processing for, for AI as well. However, as you underline, the, uh, as you underline, the problem is, okay, on ground, you have, let's say, in brackets, uh, unlimited resource. You have a megawatt uh, or gigawatt <laughs> even, and uh, but in space uh, we we are limited by the we are limited by the volume we are limited by the the, the 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 power that the solar panel can deliver, and even worse if you go to like the the small helicopter you you've seen on Mars the uh, ingenuity, and mm -hmm. uh, then 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 for sure we need the low power uh, we need computational power because we process images real time images in. Uh, as I said, uh, in 1K, for instance, 1K resolution, but we, you have to do it in uh, for few watts, you know. Okay, so that's one extreme uh, application, for sure, where we need uh, miniaturization. Uh, it's not the only one, but uh, typically rover, lander, drones, uh, maybe telecommunication satellite, okay, yeah, you have more, more power on board, but uh, this power, um, yes, could, could, is used today. We have... Uh, the massive processing, parallel processing. It's not based on AI, but um, uh, yeah, we do uh, all kind of uh, regenerative on board, um, modulation, demodulation for the regenerative satellite. So yes, the, just to say the the power is a key driver indeed for 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 our, our application. Mm -hmm. And we see that today the solution. Sorry to make it short. Uh, the solution as proposed. What which sol solution do we have today for space? We we mainly have um, FPGAs. Some of those FPGA consume can consume up to 100 watt. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. No. So uh, again, uh, so uh, people start to look at, um, at those technology. I will not name them, but um, we we all know uh, very well. Okay, uh, uh, okay. I can say the Xilinx, for instance, and um, but. Uh, it's very attractive technology in terms of computational power. However, the, the cost, the, the cost of uh, yeah, the, the power, the cooling, the DC-DC the uh, distribution uh, is a challenge. I have to say. Uh, it looks like Luis wants to uh, interject something. Luis. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so well, I would I will I would like to also say that the it is true what you mentioned that usually you require a lot of computational power, but mm -hmm. Let's say there are a lot of factors to consider. Uh, first of all, we have different type of or size of, of satellites. For example, with different different budget uh, budget uh, uh, power budget. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same as CubeSat that are uh, class A satellites. So it's not the uh, class A emission satellite. Not the same. Also, there are a lot of techniques uh, and applications where you might require less. You are still using AI, let's say, for uh, signal processing, and you still uh, you don't require that large. Uh, you still require uh, computational capabilities, but maybe not mm -hmm. in in the order of magnitude that we are discussing here when we are talking about huge capabilities. Mm -hmm. And yes, as Laurent mentioned, uh, I think it's, it's it's a trade off in all the situations, depending on the requirements or your specific application and your mission. Depending on the requirements of you, the hardware that you can use, multiple processor, FPGAs, uh, accelerators, neuromorphic, no, depending on, on on that. So there is a myriad of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, I could, just wanted to to clarify that yes, uh, we require uh, computational power, but it's not always that amount that we are thinking. There are situations where we under two bats or three bats, we can also get algorithms working. AI algorithms, uh, mm -hmm. and even the models. There are specific models, and here we are spinning in from outside of the space sector. So you are running AI in your mobile phone, whenever mm -hmm. you are. So uh, you are running AI in many IoT devices, and and many many devices with also power restrictions. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a, it's a trade-off. Mm 
on requirements and hardware capabilities and yeah. software capabilities and yeah. Right, but you can imagine the implications of having of using a lot of power. You know, you you have to either harvest power or you have to have really good batteries that'll last a lifetime. Or <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Atomic, yeah. atomic mm -hmm. power source. Then you have to get then once you're running your device, you have heat and you have to worry about heat dissipation. Right. Um, you know, and so, so there's like a cascade of effects that happens when you when you have systems that take a lot of power. So do you see um, you know technologies you know. You know, I think you you mentioned the neuromorphic. Do you think that is uh, one of the ways forward to reducing the the power requirements for these AI applications? Yeah, Laurent. I think first we have to better understand where we may deploy neuromorphic because neuromorphic may may not be suited for all use cases. So. Mm -hmm. So we are we are carefully looking and we are leading uh, activities studies at the moment to to better understand where this we may benefit from this technology mm -hmm. and why it could um, replace or supplement uh, traditional or other technology like uh, uh, GPUs uh, FPGAs um, art artificial let's say with trad traditional artificial neural network uh, uh, architecture you know so. So that we are in this uh, evaluation phase, but we do believe that, uh, yeah, uh, neuromorphic uh, for everything related to um, uh, video, uh, real-time uh, video processing. And we see exam example I mentioned before, like uh, servicing uh, robotic arm, you know, you, cap you have to capture objects and you need to process image in, in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we do believe that uh, neuromorphic can, could be very uh, beneficial there. Yes, of mm -hmm. course. We we could use GPU, but GPUs or large, very large FPGA technology. We we will look and we are looking at those technologies at the moment. But uh, as you said, you have a, this cascade effect when you the, the more power, then you have to take into account the, yeah, the, the how you may supply the device, but also how you may cool the device. Usually the package is also large and complex package also. So there are a lot of, lot of um, and then, and therefore, you increase the cost of your um, your mission and your, your equipment, your mission. So, so it has indeed, a, a, as you underlined, a, a cascade effect. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Luis? Luis, did you want to add something? Uh, uh, Laurent is always uh, answering perfectly the question, so <laughs> it, it, it's always left for me to to add. But no, uh, uh, exactly that. So, and and again. I think coming back a bit to the answer I gave before, it depends a lot on the situation. So, for example, I think talking about neuromorphic, I think it, it, it might it might make perfect sense when we combine neuromorphic with the event-based sensors, for, for instance, okay, oh. because they, because then you can really take advantage of the sparsity and the asynchronicity of of the sensors and the neuromorphic uh, um, um, computational uh, uh, paradigms. Mm. Uh, so, so, the various other situation will not. We, so we, we, uh, some people may not be uh, familiar with terms like sparsity um, and event-based sensors. Like, could you, um, you know, just expand just a little bit and uh, and uh, describe what you what you mean when you say that? Uh, sparsity means that not not all the nodes will be activated for for getting an, an, a specific output in an neuromorphic mm -hmm. uh, uh, technology. Like, for example, mm -hmm. in a traditional in a traditional uh, um, neural network. Everything is everything is you are comp you are making, making computational all the weight of the neural network. You basically you are making multiplications and all the weights are, are used. While in a neuromorphic in this capacity allow you not to use all the maybe all the connections, and mm -hmm. that that has an impact on the power, for example. And the event based sensor is is something similar. Instead of having frames, you have you detect changes. So it's a, you detect an event. Not not a specific frame of a, of a specific uh, situation. So in this this kind of combination, I think is where maybe neuromorphic might might make sense. So there are other situations where maybe it might not. So that's what Laura mentioned that we are completely exploring all this range of applications to see where it make where it makes sense and where not. But only okay. as, as as we say before, uh, I, I, almost every every directory directorate on the agency is looking at the use of AI and. And it's, a, it's a truly, it's truly a very collaborative, collaborative effort. So, mm -hmm. from 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 let's say from from the software division where I belong, belong or the the data microelectronics where Lohan 
where, I, where Laura and we belong, we are having a lot of fun on, on looking at this uh, software and uh, our capability. So. Yeah, I would say just to complement Luis, I mean, uh, ISA is a big organization and we have a different uh, sort of software directorate, the electronic director, electric engineering directorate, I belong, but we have telecom, earth observation. And I would say in all directorate today, all uh, people are shifting their mind and looking where AI, I'm, I'm not saying neuromorphic, but where AI could, uh, yeah. could, uh, could benefit. I mean, and uh, there are various for telecom. People are looking typically for uh, beamforming uh, uh, applications, you know, anti-jamming application, uh, you know. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, and Earth observation, okay, I mentioned the, the use case of the cloud, but this one is really um, easy case, I would say. Uh, we are looking at um, maritime, for instance, iceberg detection, you know. Uh, so that, I would say today, yes, uh, it's a multidisciplinary, as we, we said, we all try to, okay, we co collaborate with our, our colleagues from the different directorate to better understand the use case, mm -hmm. to better understand the algorithm needed and associ associated to those use cases. Mm -hmm. See how the which hardware platform, and it's more my uh, my domain to look uh, which hardware platform uh, could be the most suited suitable for the for the given use case and given mm -hmm. uh, model, and then of course uh, last but not least, uh, Luis, the software, the the stack flow. I mean to uh, evaluate the, the the tool, the maturity of the tool, and uh, and together also to see how we may uh, just to jump back to the the start of this discussion the the. Mm -hmm because today we have a software standard to qualify classic software but how do shall we handle um, uh, ai uh, that's a, a new paradigm you know so we are looking at that yeah and the software section in particular yeah, so, yeah yes. Luis. and, and oh, oh, not so there is a so this uh, how our software stack we are looking at that and as, as we were discussing before all the new new challenges for uh, validating and verif um, doing verif validation and verification of such system for for the mm -hmm. space or for the use of uh, in the space. So it's a yeah, it's truly uh, quite a quite a challenge and uh, and very uh, uh, again an heterogeneous exercise uh, that we are all doing uh, in the different department and divisions of the agency. Mm. So so in the U.S., um, you know, NASA and other agencies use. Uh a way of rating the readiness of technology. And it's called the technology uh, TRL level. I guess it's oh. technology readiness level. And uh, it ranges from, you know, just having an idea to uh, something that's operating in the uh, in the intended environment. And I think it was a, a really big deal when we were able to put something up in space to show that we can have something in the intended environment. Uh, how do you think that positions uh, us in terms of, you know, in terms of the neuromorphic players? You know, I realize that other technology may be, uh, you know, may be considered, but, you know, how does, do you think that that puts uh, brain chip at an advantage? Um, if, if you can, you know, yeah, Laurent. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. First of all, we use uh, as well the TRL, the same TRL as uh, oh. our uh, colleagues uh, from uh, NESA. Mm -hmm. So from TRL-1 to TRL-9, uh, flight proven. Usually, before we fly a technology, we, we have to, I mean, to, to reach on ground, I mean, to demonstrate that the technology in the same, uh, in the relevant environment, so you do temperature test, radiation test, uh, vibration mm -hmm. test, pass you the details. So that's TRL-6. I mean, that the technology has not flown yet, but uh, has been tested, validated in a re relevant uh, environment. So today, uh, not making a focus on brainship, but uh, I would say yes. Okay, we are we are in the low TRL where where we evaluate the let's say the the, uh, the, the the useful. I mean, the, where this technology may make sense. I mean, which which use case. I mean, and um, and uh, so I would say we are in the somewhere in the TRL two three um, area. And uh, but still, some work has to be done to uh, robustify, uh, to test the, the 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 technology. Okay, to under for the codes under radiation effect, mm -hmm. uh, IP to if we may integrate the IP in the radar that on the radar the ASIC technology. So we have to 
uh, to look um, at different aspects, also so soft error mitigation, for instance, and uh, to ensure that uh, if the device is, uh, you know, the space is a really harsh environment, temperature, uh, radiation effect. So uh, if you have a, a particular heavy ion hitting the device, to be sure that the, you, you don't go in a deadlock, for instance. So there are a lot of things to be, to be done before this technology will, uh, uh, will fly, even if it's um, recently, yes, we learned that uh, one week ago, uh, the, the Australian company N61 uh, from the device. Uh, okay, it's uh, as I said, you have the two tracks approach, the codes and the embedded IP. So we are looking at the moment at the two. The codes is more for um, class four, five missions. So let's say cheap mission. If we go to class one mission, then uh, safety critical, we will have to do things in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, proper way uh, and proper way mean to look at all aspects, the architecture, how to mitigate uh, fault, uh, how to prevent what we call a single event failure interrupt, all these type of things. Yes. Okay. okay. So, yes. So, so it seems that, you know, um, you know, we've had quite a great discussion. Um, you know, you know, we, we know now that that uh, AI is here to stay in space in, in some form. Um, you know, what the actual hardware is, um, there's, you know, many different technologies that are being evaluated, you know, including FPGAs. Um, neuromorphic may have some big advantages, um, but there's, there's still a way to go before we can, uh, we can prove out all the advantages, uh, uh, you know, for ESA. Um, but, it, but the future, would you say, looks promising for neuromorphic technology? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I think, um, okay, I don't want to monopolize uh, the talk, maybe Luis, you want <laughs> to comment? Uh, uh, no, uh, yes, yes, uh, as, uh, you, as you mentioned, so we are exploring uh, different uh, technologies and neuromorphic is one of them. And there are, I think, a specific aspect where neuromorphic might bring benefit, like, for example, power consumption mm -hmm. um, compared with others. But but again, it all depends on the on the application where you want to use uh, this uh, the type of uh, technology. But it's, it's centrally, it definitely is uh, is what very interesting technology. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically in terms of the power consumption and also the 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 execution time, the inference time of this uh, of this uh, type of technologies compared maybe with others is also quite interesting in in cases where you might require this this type of um, of um, Past, past execution from input to output. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, um, Luis, Laurent, I'd like to thank you for being here with us today. It was a very, oh, wait, there's more. I'd like to mention, uh, just to mention before we end this uh, interview, I mean, we, so as you know, there is a cooperation uh, ongoing mm -hmm. uh, to integrate the Brainship IP within the, I think it's important to make, within the, from Greg Geisler uh, system on chip. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's a one, uh, let's say, uh, just to say it's a Pathfinder project where we will manufacture an, an ASIC uh, on a radar uh, process. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I think it, it will be also because a way to enable our colleagues to test their use case on a concrete hardware platform. Mm -hmm. So this, this is, on the way, and we aim to tap uh, tap out uh, ideally before the end of the year, beginning of next year. So I will leave, uh, of course, uh, Frank Greg Geisler and Brainship uh, comment on uh, in the coming months on the outcome of this uh, activity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, beyond that, we we also look, uh, I would say, uh, for um, a standalone large hardware accelerator low power for our future mm -hmm. mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it's very important for us to have an, an IP which is fully scalable. So you can, uh, um, yeah, from one processing node to many processing nodes, you know. So many can be 100 processing nodes, for instance. And, uh, and to be able to uh, deploy this uh, technology on the, uh, Various process nodes. So, from today, we are using for space mainly the 28 nanometer FDSOI from mm -hmm. the SP, but to deploy maybe uh, on the 7 nanometer uh, technology. And uh, so that's why, I mean, um, yeah, 
we, we need to have solid partner to help us in this uh, undertaking. And uh, I would say the, the cooperation Brainship Geister is just the first step toward, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, uh, system on ship, robust system on ship for future um, space use, cl class one, class one mission, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think we should uh, probably wrap up right now, but it looks like we have an exciting uh, future uh, together. So, mm -hmm. so again, thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Luis. And um, you know, we look forward to uh, further collaboration. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Very interesting discussion. Thank okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Brain Chip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.